Christ, all reality coheres, comes together. It was Teilhard de Chardin who first spoke of the third nature of Christ, not human or divine, but cosmic, encompassing the unimaginable, infinite, beyond human, beyond divine. Christ over all, through all, in all. Now, decades later, Matthew Fox took that idea and wrote the book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, where he articulates this as the quest for the divine pattern that connects us, the heavens with earth through grounding all in the joy and suffering of the historical Jesus. Our experience of this cosmic Christ must begin in the concrete world we know best. Jesus, as a real person, told stories like that of the Good Shepherd we examined last week, and those stories capture us still. Jesus lived and modeled a liberating life and practiced a hospitality and generosity that remains our model. Jesus did that without denying the reality of the hostilities around him, without avoiding the suffering that was a result of his prophetic vision. Jesus experienced death on a cross and cried out for the forgiveness of his persecutors. David Tulin, priest and science scholar, says, in Jesus, the cosmos finally finds adequate soul space, a cavern of interiority big enough to contain the fullness of divine love and compassion. God poured all into Christ, the firstborn of creation, and we are in that same lineage. God seeks to pour all into our lives so that we may become fully human, so that we too may become cosmic. Despite what we may see and experience, in Christ, all things hold together. Now, physicist Stephen Hawking who wrote A Brief History of Time, searched for, a, searched for a theory of everything. I don't think he assumed that Christ held that key, but the writers of Colossians did, and in that vein, I'd like to provide a brief physics lesson with a distinctly theological bent. Says the cosmos, or world, or universe, is composed of subatomic particle waves, which are no more controllable than the waves of the ocean, we can best envision them as constantly expanding and replenishing. Matter, this, this, matter can be thought of as bound and condensed energy. It is not as separate and discrete as we experience. For example, the energy contained in the subatomic particles of this pulpit can be released with what? A match. <laughs> exactly. There is bound energy all around us. Now, Tulin writes that the atoms of one thing entangle themselves with the fields of another, and thus everything is internally related to everything else. The mutual impact may be negligible, but the new star born near the constellation Aquila doesn't make a move without affecting you and I. Nor do we make a move without affecting said star. Matter, energy, is profoundly social. Communion not isolation is the rule within the universe. Now, 
That is a scholar's way of saying our interior lives are connected with the way the universe exists and operates. When we meander along the beach, as our soul is nourished by the rhythm of the waves and the grains of the sand on the beach, the sun on our arms, so too are the grains and the waves and the fish within them nourished by our wholesome presence. As energy flows in and around and through us, through nature, we are quite literally descendants of the stars, for energy continues to emanate from their center. Energy is profoundly communal. It is the cosmic Christ who connects us to all things and to all people of all times. John Dunn got it right. Remember his no man got an island? Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes a parched passage while he was isolated in a prison cell of the sustaining importance of fellowship. He writes, it is easily forgotten that the fellowship of Christian brothers and sisters and siblings is a gift of grace, a gift of the kingdom of God that any day may be taken from us, that the time that still separates us from utter loneliness may be brief indeed. Therefore, let those who until now have had the privilege of a living, common Christian life with other Christians, praise God's grace from the bottom of their hearts. Let them thank God and declare it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with fellow Christians. Imprisoned Bonhoeffer lacked the opportunity to personally give and receive love and blessing, and his spirit sagged as he missed the positive energy of community. In its place was the destructive, barraging hostility of the Nazi guards. In like manner, when a tree yields its energy in a careless forest fire, or the rains turn damaging to, to damaging storms, we are diminished when the energy becomes destructive. We are living in a time when fear of those who are other than us is being heightened and drawn to an extreme. From immigrants who struggle relentlessly to crash Across vast images of desert in the hope of finding honest work to the hijab wearing Muslim who covers her hair out of modesty and respect to the libraries where books are banned. We are told we share no commonality because energy is profoundly communal. We have lived through many poisonous weeks and seasons. Fear quashes compassion, anxiety fuels anger, doom narrows vision, and the energy around us becomes caustic as we move from a virtuous cycle to a vicious cycle. When we cast all our hostilities on another, thinking of them as the enemy or the stranger, the plotter of aggression, we find it impossible to build a creative or reconciling relationship. Only when we envision the other as one for whom Christ offered up all, or that aggressor as one who carries the very image of God, our creator, will our vision change. Then we can imagine ourselves in service to this one. 
We can experience our lives becoming expansive as we draw forth the other's best gifts through our blessing of them. In God's presence, we can reimagine the other as fully human. Before all time, Christ is. As time ends, Christ is. Wherever we go, from field to forest, from work to home, from heights to depths, we can find a reflection of God in Christ. But we must open our eyes. We must raise our expectations, imagining the world anew in order to know the Christ who walks among us, who binds not only the matter of the building we sit in, but also knits our hearts together as one. We are watching what happens in the world when we lose sight of our common humanity and we allow fear to direct our lives. There's a wonderful parable told of losing sight of Christ among us. An aging abbot sought the wisdom of a desert hermit with a tale of woe. Once his monastery had been filled with young truth seekers and the chants of saints filled the halls, but now there are only a few ancient monks who went about their duties with heavy hearts. The abbot kneeled before the hermit. Is it because of some sin that the monastery has been reduced to this state? Yes replied the hermit, a sin of ignorance. What might that sin be? Ah, one of your number is the Messiah in disguise, and you are ignorant of this. And having shared these words, the hermit closed his eyes, returned to his prayers and meditation. Throughout the long journey back to the monastery, the abbot's heart beat fast as he marveled that the Messiah had returned to earth and was living in his monastery. Who could it be? Brother Cook, mm, somewhat sloppy. Brother Treasurer, ooh, very parsimonious. Brother Tri Prior, too many defects to name, but the hermit said the Messiah was in disguise. Could the flaws be part of the disguise? For all in the monastery had defects. <laughs> when he returned and assembled all the monks, he told them of his discovery. They looked at one another in disbelief. The Messiah here in Edible. They looked searchingly at one another, finally realizing that if the Messiah were in disguise, they would not recognize him. So each began to treat one another with great respect and consideration. It was not long before the atmosphere of the monastery became vibrant with joy. Soon dozens of truth sinkers were once again joining them in pilgrimage, and the abbey echoed with the holy and joyful chant of monks aglow with the spirit of love. The cosmic Christ is here today embodied in this church, in this community, connecting all in all, will we allow our fear or anger or another's limits to keep us living in isolation and ignorance, or will we honor all whom we meet as the Messiah in a mask? Energy is profoundly communal. 
Will we use our energy to celebrate Christ's reign by, by offering our best gifts in service to others so that all may fully become human in God's presence? May it be so, Lord. May it be so. Amen. Have you been blessed today, church? Yes. Good, good, good. This is not my abuela's mocajete, but it is a mocajete. Uh, just show of hands, how many of you know what a mocajete is? Some of you, okay. This mocajete I purchased when I was in La República Dominicana um, on one of four trips that I took in about 12 months to the Dominican Republic with high school students and college students on mission trips. We were building churches and schools. And I can remember the trip that I found this on was with a particular group of high school students that some people may label as um, underserved, um, with less privilege, um, marginalized, the students, in order to participate on this trip, needed to write an essay because they were receiving a scholarship to fly them to another country to build a building. Uh, so that's motivation. And on this particular trip, I remember we were building a large school with cinder block, I mean laying the block. That, that was our job and, and gathering for worship every, every night. And one of the groups of students that I was working with, about three of us, were really hungry. It was really hot and really muggy. And so we saw a local walking down the road selling avocados. Now, you get avocados in the store and they're this size or sometimes a little bigger. I kid you not, the avocado we bought that day was as big as my head. And if you have talked to me directly, you know how big my head is. <laughs> Don't laugh, Gretchen. <laughs> so the avocado was so big that we, the four of us cut it into quarters and we ate it right there. And it was so good. And it was so delicious. Well, the mocajete is something that I can remember my abuela using to crush spices. You take the pistol and you'll pound it into the mocajete. And you can crush the spice, you can crush pepper, you can even make guacamole in a mocajete. And, and sometimes they're big because they want to hold a lot of contents and sometimes they're this size. And in about a week or so, I will have my abuela's mocajete gifted to me by my uncle. The reason I bring this to you today is because our community is a lot like this mocajete. Some people 